Um, thank you, Carolina. So I hope that you're okay with um, recording everything. Welcome everyone. My name is Angel Munoz and I'm a senior scientist here at BSC, uh, the, um, the Earth Sciences Department. And it's a pleasure uh, to introduce to you um, Laurel Becerra. She's a PhD candidate at Columbia University working at the International Research Institute for Climate and Society. Um, before her PhD, she actually was uh, working as a, a researcher at uh, the IRI, the International Research Institute for Climate and Society, working on climate services, in particular for climate and health. Uh, actually, to the best of, our, of my knowledge, um, the first ever paper showing predictability at subsystemal time scale for dengue was uh, a paper led by Laurel. Which uh, also has a very interesting title. Maybe at some point she should talk to us about that. But today and tomorrow, she's going to be talking to us about um, part of her uh, PhD work at Columbia. And it has to do, you will see very soon directly from her, it has to do with uh, something called cross time scale interference. And the title of this uh, talk is uh, A Web of Teleconnections How They Combine Effects of Climate Driver Influences Seasonal Rainfall Patterns. So, Real pleasure for me to welcome you here at the BSC family, Laurel, and the floor is all yours. All right. Well, thank you everyone for coming. It's good to see everybody. Um, like Angel said, my name is Laurel. Uh, I just wanted to make a note in the right hand corner up there. Uh, I have a QR code, and that's for citations for this work specifically. So it's also on the pages or on the slides that I have references. So if there are any slides that you find interesting, um, yeah, feel free to use that. Um, I work at pseudo work at the IRI, um, but I'm doing my PhD with Columbia University. And um, this work was done in combination with Anhal, myself and Yukonan Kushner at Flamont um, Doherty Earth Observatory. Um, yeah, so we can get started. Uh, I just wanted to spend, no. Ah, okay. I just wanted to spend a couple minutes talking about some of the work I've done at the IRA and with Angel uh, before I start talking about my research. Um, so the IRI's vision um, is to be uh, very um, demand-driven, um, looking at the needs of the users and understanding what exactly they need. Um, so this is a photo from time I spent in Guatemala working uh, with locals to understand what tools are needed for them to help um, best um, protect their, their agricultural um, endeavors, um, whether that's livestock or um, water management, for example. So uh, really great time working with them and understanding, you know, having that co-production co of knowledge where we learn with them and, and they also teach us. So um, that was a lot of fun. And I also spent whoop, a little bit of time working um, with folks, as Anhal had mentioned, in the climate and health sector. Um, and I was able to take a trip right before the world shut down with COVID to Trinidad and Tobago, where we were working with the Caribbean Public Health Agency to implement or um, explain new tools for um, mosquito-borne disease monitoring. So that was a lot of a lot of fun. Got to meet a lot of people and hear a lot about what they're doing. So yeah, just something that, you know, the pre-COVID um, life, I guess, is, is nice to think about. Um, so I just wanted to give a broad scale of what I'm doing on my PhD so you guys can kind of see how it falls into place. So the first chapter um, I'm going to be talking about today and tomorrow, um, looking at how we can use a diagnostic approach to understand cross time scale interference. Um, cross time scale interference is essentially how different climate drivers, which I'll define in a minute, how they impact each other across the time, different time scales. So um, subseasonals seasonal, um, indicatal, interannual, these, these type of things. So I spent a good chunk of time working on understanding how specifically ENSO and the MJO impact each other, um, spent some time at EGU. For those of you who were there, I presented some work on um, the three-year-long La Nina and how different climate drivers impacted that. Um, and then um, some work on a map room, which I'll explain in a little bit, uh, which is just an online tool. Uh, second chapter, we'll be looking mostly at 
um, model diagnostics with cross time scale interference. And then the third chapter will be looking into prediction with Bayesian analysis of cross time scale interference. So that's kind of like what I'll be looking at. Um, so just as a little bit of motivation, we understand that adding uh, modes of variability into our models can greatly improve their um, skill and worth, really. I mean, we look at adding how adding El Nino Southern Oscillation really improved forecasting um, just on a seasonal scale. And we also know that um, doing the same with the MJO also can and can help with models. Um, and then I like, I just really like <laughs> um, incorporating how these different um, climate drivers impact each other can really help us to better understand the system as a whole. And so like the goal of what Angel and I have been working on is to understand, you know, how this can be then incorporated into models to improve, um, you know, forecasts. So this is kind of the general goal. Um, I did say I would mention what a climate driver is. So we define a climate driver as an internal forcing mechanism that originates within the climate system, has distinct phases fluctuating across time scales, um, and produces local and remote influences, whether that be like rainfall or temperature differences um, on various time scales. So it just depends on the driver. Um, and cross time scale interference itself is not. Um, there are people who have looked at it in the past, but I think momentum is really picking up on, on folks who are seeing um, the importance and use of understanding how they impact each other. Um, so there's just a handful. I mean, we have tons of papers, um, but I would say like Angel has been working on this for quite some time um, and kind of infected my brain with being interested <laughs> in working on it as well. So <laughs> Um, so that's why I've been motivated to do this research. Um, so the main reason, um, the main topic of this paper, I guess, is trying to understand if we can identify signals from ENSO and the MJO using um, a diagnostic approach, and if we can tease apart their contributions. And we'll look at this both from a linear and nonlinear perspective, um, just from some methodology that um, is not a definite you know, solution for this, but it's one way that we've found that we can um, use methods to understand the nonlinearity and linearity in the system. Um, so I'm sure many of you are familiar with linear superposition, um, but just understanding how waves impact each other um, when they have similar characteristics. Um, they can um, amplify each other or the signal, for example, and they can destroy it. So we see this happening um, in some of the results, which I'll get to in a moment. Um, and we're really interested in understanding um, this idea of destruction or um, amplifying of the, the strength. And this is linear, so then understanding like what the nonlinear response might be. Um, so just some like, housekeeping, some of the data that we use. Um, all of our data is daily because the MJO acts on a daily scale um, or time scale, at least you can't really take a monthly picture of the MJO. So we're looking daily here. Um, so we interpolated the Nino 3.4 monthly index to get it on the daily time scale um, using CPC Unified Global Daily Rainfall. Um, and we created composites. We did a composite analysis. Um, and those are the tercels used for ENSO. So we have a composite for um, El Nino, which is looking at the Nino 3.4 index of 0.5 or greater and negative for La Nino would be 0.5, negative 0.5 or less. And then this in-between part is a neutral composite, what we call it. And we use statistical significance masking to, um, which is correlated by the sample size to apply to the composite. So that'll be like white. So they'll be kind of grayish inside the land, but then like any place that's not significant will be white. Um, sample size is about 4,000 days for reference. It's 17, 1979 through 2022. Um, yeah, so I guess we can just dive right in. So this was um, the composite for El Nino. So granted, keep in mind, this is, um, not for strong, this is just a general composite. So we see, you know, there are going to be ENSO events that are much stronger in their anomalies for precipitation. Sorry that the 
the scale is on its side like that, but it got a little squishy with a figure that's going to appear on the other side. Um, but we can see there's general similarities to well-known, um, for example, cartoons that we see that have been produced, for example, from the IRI. Um, we see that, you know, these dry places such as over Brazil, for example, or Australia are represented and um, visible in, you know, in these other um, composites that have been created. Um, so this is what, this is one of the basic results that we call kind of an independent composite. So we're looking solely at one climate driver. Um, I just put this here. If you want to see it, I'm not going to go too into depth, but because we're going to focus on El Nino for this talk, but we have the La Nina composite and the Enso Neutro composite. So um, the number of days at the top, remember, this is out of like 4,000 days sample size. Um, but we do see similar um, characteristics to uh, the La Nina. I just didn't put them out from the IRI here. So, but we can talk about this more if you're interested in, in seeing what the talking about them in. Um, so we did the same thing as well um, for, so this is, um, and so, but we did the same thing as well for the Matt and Julian oscillation. I'm assuming most people are familiar with the MJO, but I thought I would just say a brief little thing, but the MJO is like a band of storms that moves around the equator every 30 to 60 days. Um, and we track it using this diagram, a uh, Wheeler-Hendon diagram. Um, and if you saw my poster at EGU, if any of you were there, we, I talked a lot about <laughs> the MJO in um, the diagram. But essentially, you have these big triangles. Can every, everybody can see my pointer, I hope, online. But you see these big triangles. They represent different areas of the world. So you can kind of see Western Horn of Africa. And then on the top is the Western Pacific Maritime Continent. So the MJO is kind of tracked based on its location and how strong it is. So it can be in any of these areas and how far away it is from like the center of the circle is how strong it is. Um, and then anything within the circle, uh, we define as uh, inactive MJO. So the, and it's just very weak and not present. Um, and we consider it to be a, a ninth phase of the MJO, which is inactive. So we give it, we actually give it a phase itself. It's, I guess, special, <laughs> it has its own phase inactivity. Um, so when we did that, I know this is going to be hard to see for the screen for folks in the room, um, but we essentially created composites like for ENSO using the MJO here um, and distinct and different. You can kind of see how interesting it is if we just focus on Brazil, which is probably easiest to see in this. So this is during um, all years, so about 4,000 days. We can see how distinctly um, rainfall is shifting. Um, and I'll go here. It's a little bit, we don't have the rainfall over the ocean, um, but you can kind of see in the red circles where the rainfall is. It's kind of hard to see on here, but the rainfall is moving eastward as the MJO propagates. Um, like I said, I'll share the slides. So if you want to look at them more in depth, it'll be a little bit easier to see. Um, yeah. Oh, and I forgot to say, if you have questions about anything, please feel free to speak up. Even those on Zoom, feel free. Um, if there's something that's unclear, just let me know. Hopefully nothing's unclear yet. <laughs> but if there is, yeah, just let me know. Um, yeah. So what I did during the beginning of my PhD is I also spent time working with the IRI data library. I'm not sure if anyone has used the IRI data library, but it's like a um, a place where you can get data um, and use map rooms and really play with, um, you can like visualize all of the data that you want right on the map room. You don't have to put it into a coding language. I mean, you, it, it has its own special coding language, but um, they use make it um, a little bit easier to use so you don't have to learn Ingrid, which is the coding language. Um, but I compiled a whole bunch of indices um, for a lot of different drivers and I created with the help of a few folks from the data library, a map room where um, we have the composites for all of these here and you can compare them with composited sea surface temperature. Um, so we're hoping that that is published by next week so I can show it at an, a presentation I'm giving for my dissertation. Um, but yeah, uh, if you guys are interested, I can send the link along when it gets done. But a good way to compare it to observations as well as um, pressure and wind vectors. So 
yeah little public service announcement. <laughs> um, so we were looking mostly in a linear sense when we created the ENSO and the MJO composites. And so we were wondering, can we see um, any contributions for rainfall from the MJO and ENSO um, non-linearly? So this is where we think things get quite interesting. Um, so to do this, what we did is we said, OK, all right, we're going to look at, let's start with El Nino. We're going to look at all days where we have classified um, the sea surface temperature in the Pacific has classified as El Nino, so greater than 0 0.5. Um, and then within all those days, we're going to pick, we're going to separate all the days where the MJO is in different phases. So you can see this here with the red bars. You can see whenever we were in El Nino, and then the MJO is in specific phases. And then we did the same for La Nina um, and Enso neutral. Um, so we can see the bulk of the time the MJO is inactive um, within the unit circle. Uh, but we do see that um, there are phases that are favored by the MJO um, during El Nino and La Nina, or dependent, you know, they might be forced depending on where the convection is within the Pacific Ocean, for example. Um, and so we collected all of those days and made a composite analysis based on that, um, which is also going to be a little bit difficult to read here on the screen, but. Um, hopefully everyone can see it online, but we can see, which I what I find the most interesting is that even though we're in an El Nino phase, you know, for example, phase four is of the MJO is going to produce very different rainfall than phase eight, even during El Nino. Um, so we see that there is this um, inconsistency with how the MJO behaves depending um, or how, yeah, how the MJO differs in each phase depending on the ENSO phase. And I have one of these maps for La Nina um, as well as ENSO neutral as well, if you're interested, but just for time's sake, I thought we would just look at, um, at this first. So I, I decided to blow one of them up. So this is what it looks like. The sample size is 121 days. Um, this is phase four, which we'll look more into in a little bit. But we can see um, the drying over, over Brazil and North America or North Northern South America and um, above normal precipitation in a variety of locations. Um, so we think that this is <laughs> this is interesting that we're able to like separate out how these rainfall patterns change. Um, so that brings us to our last interest in this specific work is understanding how um, these climate drivers may amplify or attenuate each other, how they may strengthen or um, you know destroy one another spatially and temporally. Uh, and to do this, I looked at two different years or two different El Nino years as two two case studies. So I looked at an El Nino event, um, two, I mean, two very strong El Nino events, the 2015-2016 El Nino event and then 1997-98 El Nino event um, to understand, try to like just see if the two events differed in any way that we can discernibly see with the, the composites and like try to understand why that might be. Um, so I have one figure, um, but I thought it would be easier to just have bigger images um, so that it's easier to see. But this is what the um, rainfall anomaly anomalies look like in um, October, November, December of 2015. Um, I think I didn't address this earlier, but I had selected this time period because it was relevant to some crop growing seasons. Um, so that's why it's OND, not DJF, for example. Um, but we see this really strong above or below normal rainfall signal over Brazil, um, Southeast South America got, you know, pummeled with rain, um, as well as the United States and parts of China as well. Um, so this is what we observed. And if we're going to compare it to the independent composite just for El Nino, we can see that there are similarities. If I like go between the two, we can kind of see that there are similarities, but because this was such a strong event, it's not going to be well as well represented in the composite um, just because it was so strong. Um, but yeah, general similarities. Um, and then what we did is we started to um, you know, take, try to take the composite and subtract it from what we observed 
to try to understand what is what we would consider a residual or this rainfall that is unexplained, um, which we, we, what is what we can see here. And then we thought, okay, we have a couple different tools now that we can use for nonlinear, um, linearly and nonlinearly looking at rainfall based on the MJO and ENSO. So how can we apply it and see how these two different events, um, you know, how did the MJO and ENSO act differently? So one of these approaches, which um, uses the two linear independent composites that I created, this is the one I just showed you, the El Nino composite. So this is just linearly adding. So this is just one way that we thought that maybe we could represent um, rainfall if we have the ENSO signal and the MJO signal, we just add them together, literally just adding the two composites together and we get this pattern of rainfall. Um, and then the other way, which I had shown before, is to do the joint analysis. Um, I think I have that in here. Yeah, or no, this is um, this is just the joint added. It's just bigger. <laughs> so if you wanted to see it bigger, this is bigger. Um, and then we have the joint condition composite here, which is what we looked at prior, where we had them conditioned looking at only days during El Nino where MGO was in phase four. And phase four was selected because of its frequency during um, this particular OMD season. So MJO was um, frequented in phase four of the MJO. Sorry, can you uh, remind me where's the uh, precipitation in phase four of the MJO? Yes, Here, I'll just put it because it'll be hard to draw. The rain or the precipitation, it'll be- Okay, yeah. It'll be somewhere around okay. here. Okay. It'll just be, yeah. Um, yeah, so then we subtracted them. So this is going to be a lot of just um, some composites looking at the subtraction. And our goal was to understand what best represented um, the rainfall. So if we take our original, the composites when we made them, um, the joint added and the joint conditioned, and we subtract it from what, from, from the observations, if if it is closer to being all white, then we would say that that accounted for most of the rainfall anomaly that was observed. So we subtracted them from the, or the composites from the observations and we find, um, so this first one is the joint added composite. And then the second one is the joint condition composite. And we can see when we toggle between them that it differs in different regions, which captures the rainfall better. So we acknowledge that, you know, in some regions we might see linear interference, and in some regions we might see a nonlinear interference. So um, it's important to make sure that we incorporate both of those into research because some these areas will be um, impacted differently by the wave interactions. Um, and this is the this is the figure that was hard to see that I thought I would explain, but um, what we did is that we then did pattern correlations of the different composites and found that for this example, the observed joint condition was more similar to what was observed in the observations. Um, and we're still working on different ways to robustly um, test this um, in a statistical manner. So we're, we're still working um, on, well, both all of the methodology and everything, but yeah, we find here that the joint condition composite is more representative in the 2015 example. Does anyone have any questions? I have one. So how, yeah. how is the joint composite uh, in so on, uh, uh, and MGO different from, you know, a composite which you did before where you took in so pieces and, you know, or did a composite with MGO? Yeah, it's the same. Oh, it's, it's, the, it's same. the same. Yeah, yeah. Sorry if that was not clear. Yeah, I kind of, it's a little, yeah. So we made the condition and then we were comparing them to the observation. So they're just, okay. it's just the same. So yeah. basically the same thing. So it's, yeah. Okay. Yeah. They're exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, they're exactly the same. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. So I don't, Pep, yeah. Go ahead. <clears throat> Hello. Um, just one question. Would you interpret that the joint 
condition minus the joint added would be like the nonlinear um, effect, for example, saying that the joint added is a linear, for example. Would that be a correct interpretation? So I think there are, so essentially it's looking at what is left because the linear, the joint, the joint added and the joint conditioned, they're not necessarily going to be um, the same, right? Hmm. Right, because the joint condition doesn't necessarily encompass all of the joint added since we created them in two different means. So hmm. it probably has, I guess I had put it there just to represent like, what areas aren't considered by either well i guess it isn't quite that either we'd have to subtract the observations which i tried to do but that just got really complicated it just looked messy um but i guess it would be like what the joint conditioned is capturing that the joint added doesn't also capture so i guess kind of but i can't say that they're necessarily equal because we didn't come compute them in the same way. So, but, yeah. no. um, so that is cool, yeah, right? Yes. <laughs> Hi. Yeah, exactly. Pep, uh, pep slash cool, yeah. So let me see if I understand. Your question is, what is the linear superposition versus the nonlinear one? Isn't it? Like, well, what's what you're trying to detect here? I think, it, are you referring to figure F? Yeah, I'm referring to figure F. And I was wondering if I was interpreting correctly that if the joint added is a linear effect, then subtracting it from the joint condition would give you the nonlinear effect, or that is a, um, not the correct interpretation. Yeah, yeah. So it's, it's what Laurie said. Okay. So yeah. So your joint added will be the linear, and the joint condition will be the nonlinear one. And mm -hmm. this is a way to assess the difference between the two yeah. approaches. Yeah. Okay. So, so in in other words. If your nonlinear approach is equal to your linear one, there is no nonlinearity. Right. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Basically, then configure F, we would say that it's not a big difference between linear and nonlinear approach, right? Because there's no big difference. Yeah, I mean approach. regionally. The problem, yeah, I should have made it. I should have made each slide of each figure because it's hard to see it when it's so small. But um, in some regions, there is a big difference, but in other regions, there is not. It's a fixed in South America, Paraguay. It's when yeah. you have like this non -linear yeah. interaction, and it's a way to detect when right. you have and where this nonlinear interaction. Right. It's a it's a retro map to see <laughs> when and where. Here. Uh, this is happening, and, and then you can ask if the models are detecting that well. Or not. Okay. So you see Paraguay, can you show that? And F, you see that there is a lot of green. Oh, you're saying here? Yeah, it's not yeah. Stuff. You see, so it depends on where. Right. <laughs> <laughs> can I make a question? Yeah. Um, for the linear case, have you considered going beyond addition? And maybe training a linear regression point by point. Because um, it's like one case of all the possible linear combinations. So I don't know if it makes sense. We have tried other methods for um like a linear and nonlinear approach, but we have not tried that one. So okay. that is a good idea though. Okay, this is just um a framework. So like I said yeah. earlier, it's just uh yeah. it's just one method for trying. But yeah, we're we're looking into into different um we methods. We have done that with a nonlinear approach is weather types. So we identify the nonlinear patterns and then we build linear and nonlinear models with those patterns to see how it goes. So this is a different a different approach to get to the same thing. Mm -hmm. So we can talk about that as well. So this was 2015. Um, I'm not going to spend as much time in 1997-98 um, unless you guys want to hear more about it tomorrow because I'm talking a little bit more about the IOD stuff tomorrow, but I'm happy to talk more about 97-98. I 
Oh, oh, that's right. I still have some. I still have some. <laughs> um, so for 2015, what we then um, were interested in is these places. Um, we took the joint condition that had the best um, correlation coefficient to the observations. And we were looking at some of these areas that weren't necessarily um, touched when we subtracted um, the joint composite from the observations to understand if there was something else happening in the system, like what else was going on. Um, more joint or more cross time scale interference that isn't in the MJO or ENSO. Um, and in, uh, I have, this is where I have all the citations, but in different regions of the world, I just picked a few of them, um, looking at what other authors have found to be considered cross time scale interference or um, what has been observed in the past or maybe during this event, depending on the paper. Um, but we found papers describing um, in, in Central South America, talking about the impacts of the South American or a South Atlantic convergence zone um, as, and there were quite a few people who had been discussing um, for this, for that particular region, these impacts. Um, in, the, in Europe and the Mediterranean, um, the North Atlantic oscillation and its impacts um, so understanding like how that exactly impacted this event is obviously needs work and how, you know, how it really um, modulated and changed and impact MJO and ENSO. Um, so this is for below normal rainfall. For above normal rainfall, we saw, um, I found literature about the Pacific North American mode in Southeast North America. Um, Southeast South America had impacts from the South Central American Dipole, the American low level, South American low level jet, and the, the Southern annular mode and the South Atlantic convergence zone. So a lot of literature already existing, um, but we see here that the one approach that we have used like couldn't capture all the signals. So there must be something going on. Oh, as well as Canada and Arctic and Ar Antarctica, the Antarctic oscillation has impacts in both of those regions. So something to look into, citations are there. Um, so if you're interested in like investigating more, yeah, feel free to use those. <laughs> um, so, you know, there are a lot of other places. I just, I didn't get to all of them, but did you have a question? I'm going to ask about that. What's happening over India? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So there's, there's, there's a lot going on that um, some of it is just like, there's no literature. So there are a lot of areas that we're still trying to figure out like what exactly was going on or what happened during that specific event. Uh, yeah. And then what we did uh, in the analysis in the paper is looked at um, a, a forecast produced by the IRI and understanding if we would have included um, this skill from the joint condition composite, for example, how we could have predicted, for example, more rainfall over central Brazil, which was not you know, anywhere in the forecast, for example, or um, pretty much pick anywhere that you see differences between these. So having, including this nonlinear um, component into climate driver interaction is really important, something that we should be using uh, when producing forecasts. So better incorporating this into models, which is the goal is very important. So yeah, it's very nice, very nice example. And what we did then is we compared it to uh, another El Nino event, which was very different. Um, this is just one slide and it's very small, um, but you can kind of see that these two are very similar. <laughs> They're very similar. Um, their pattern correlation coefficient are very high. So it's the joint added and joint condition for the 97, 98 event. Um, and we actually see that we had um, greater correlation if we just looked at the observed um, the correlation between the observed and the independent El Nino. So this suggests, at least to us, that the 97-98 El Nino event was, um, there was less cross time scale interference from other climate drivers. And we saw that um, it was just very strong, a very strong ENSO signal in the rainfall anomalies um, with, yeah, we didn't have as many interactions with other modes of variability. So I can talk more about this tomorrow too, but that was like the general takeaway from um, from the specific research. So yeah, so there also is not a lot of literature on understanding the impacts of between different events, for example, Venso and their um, 
how drivers are influencing different events differently. So um, that's what I have for today. So some of the conclusions that I came to is that this framework that we have created um, is a tool for understanding the differences between these non-linear and linear um, interactions. Um, we can consider cross time scale interference, we can we should consider it as really important when we're doing our research because the system is complex and it's both linear and nonlinear. Um, and we can use this idea of nonlinearity of cross time scale interference and linearity in the system to diagnose uh, and diagnostics and models to help us better understand rainfall patterns. Um, keeping in mind that both linear and nonlinear are um, visible in different regions and in different instances, so they should both be considered. Yeah, and then we have the two examples. So just kind of understanding how the system is, can be influenced from year to year. So yeah, that's what I have. I'd be happy to take more questions if anyone has any. Thanks, um, thank you very much. Any questions online? Since you want to hear me, want to give you priority. Okay. Any questions here? Okay. No, okay. Oh, sorry. Uh, Pat or Pat slash Puni. Hi. Um, I was wondering if um, you considered if different ends of flavors could have an impact on your composites or if there's any yeah, difference between the, um, the way that NGO combines with different ends of flavors. That's a really good question. We have not looked into that specifically, but it um, depending on how we create the composite, right? So we just created the ENSO composites based on the sea surface temperature based in one location or the Nino 3.4 box. And then we decided on the, the negative 0.5 and 0.5 for the tercials. But I think it's like, this is a framework. So if we wanted to, we could change how we define the ENSO composites and learn about that. Um, and I, I think that would be really interesting um, to to understand how the flavors are impacted or how they impact or are impacted differently by the MJO um, and other climate drive. But yeah, yeah, I think that would be really interesting to look into. Um, we just haven't quite gotten there yet. So, can you say something about the sampling limitations? Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah. So the other problem is the sampling size, which we ran into with this. Um, analysis until we kind of tried to broaden. So we, we were using as much data as CPC Unified has right now. And um, the problem gets to be when we we try to make, um, we try to make too many flavors of ENSO, our sample size gets to be quite small. So then that impacts the, the composites itself. Um, but otherwise, yeah, I mean, if we're able to do it, I don't know, we could try and see what it looks like. But yeah, nice. so I I understand that the the sampling is um, a very big limitation, but I think I'm not a hundred percent sure, but I'm pretty sure that the two case studies that you have were relatively strong, like Eastern or Eastern and Central, and perhaps a very just Central Nino could have a different. I uh, was wondering if like another case study, perhaps uh, or something like that, could shed some light, but. Great, uh, great work. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Good. Any other question? Oh, hello. It's more about your uh, your thoughts about this because I'm reading a lot now about um, people trying to understand these cross time scales interactions from with different methods. For example, one of them is looking at the co-occurrence of two things. Yeah. And the other way is removing one thing and see how the other thing modulates. So removing the mean mm. state uh, to see uh, if what you see is just a co-occurrence or if it's because one mode is uh, modulating the other one. So have you removed the ENSO signal to see if ENSO is modulating the MJO or or what do you think about these things? I don't know. Right? I'm, I'm yeah, no, no. I think it's about the I think it's hard to remove something fully. Um, Personally, yeah, I think it would be hard to remove, you know, the ENSEL signal. Not not that it isn't possible to do, but when you remove the signal, you're going to be potentially removing 
other influ like there's codependencies right I, I don't think you can just use only one or like yeah. remove one because they're going to have codependencies which then might impact something even further you know if there are two maybe there are three or four and like that might be imp influencing the mjo can um influence off the equator you know it has impacts but then it can i was reading somewhere it can influence like that rebound off from where it was impacting can come back and influence the mjo so like you know removing something might then impact how other things function so i don't know um i would i would try to understand the co-occurrence you know and understand how they're interacting together but i don't know, I don't know maybe it, well otherwise it's also hard to compare with observations if you remove things yeah and i think that most but not all of the methods to remove signals are linear. Yeah. yeah. So then, you know, one of the questions here before going there is is it a linear or non linear interference? And I think that in general, we don't really know. So this is a, you know, a set of first attempts to try to understand that better. And there are a few, very few, I think, to the best of my knowledge, methods doing a non linear regression to remove things. Um, but still, mm. you know, I think that that is a very interesting question yeah. to see if Lori and so on. So, um, you know, we can, we have several um, SSP control experiments in models, you know, hierarchy of models to see what is impacting what and vice versa. But again, you know, it's, it's not trivial. So a lot of work to be done. We need more people to work with this. That's right. Trying to find funding to to get PhD students and postdocs to work on this thing. That's really interesting. Mm -hmm. no, so I don't have much experience about MJO, but is there any literature which tells why the phase four in particular of MJO has uh, such a huge influence for precipitation? Because it looks very similar to so then maybe it's modulated by and so on. That's why it's just getting picked up. Or I don't know. Yeah, so I think the literature describes it as um, how it overlaps and I don't know if anyone has more experience, but just understanding how it coincides with the walker circulation. So as ENSO is shifting, the walker circulation is moving, and then the MJO precipitation might, for example, stall in a region that's like very convective due to the walker circulation. Um, so that's why we see how MJO phases are preferred in different differently in different. Um, I don't have the, I, I have the composites if you want to see, but like during the La Nina, we have different pref preferences for MJO phases because the rainfall, the convection of the walker circulation is in different regions. Um, yeah, and I'll talk more about that tomorrow in um, the IOD presentation because that's also yeah. relevant there. Yeah, and I would like to follow up with Pat slash Kuli about the sample size because we, yeah. we think that we have, uh, we have a few ideas to help us with the sample size on top of physical diagnostics and modeling tools. But maybe this is not the right time. Can you tell us? That's my question. What are we going to do tomorrow? Can we get a glimpse <laughs> of what, what is this thing tomorrow and what your foster at the Yeah, so tomorrow, um, so a little bit of like a, um, come, and come back tomorrow again. <laughs> um, uh, we were interested in understanding um, how exa exactly we found ourselves in a three year long La Nina event um, and specifically what, you know, initiated this and some literature has been discussing about how it was the IOD and the Atlantic Nino and um, understanding, we were interested in understanding why the IOD was there. It was a very strong positive IOD. How did it get there? What caused it? Why did it stay for so long? And um, to try to understand then, or put contextualize the research that's there or existing about the um, Atlantic and Nino and the IOD and how that influenced La Nina. So that's what I'll be discussing tomorrow and using a similar um, compositing approach to understand, um, you know, to try to figure out why maybe the MJ have could have how it could have been. Yeah. It kind of relates to the question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Very nice. So, yeah. Any other question? Very good. Thank you, Laura. Yeah. And uh, come back tomorrow for the promise. We go to the Thank you, Laura. <laughs>
Thank you for the presentation. It was very, very interesting. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. I learned a lot from the presentation because I 